Okay, good. Uh, sorry, I was uh, muted a few times. Uh, you should now see my screen. So welcome again, in, in case that, uh, that didn't work out the first time. Uh, we're starting the webinar. The webinar will take about 50 minutes, uh, roughly, uh, and it will be followed by a Q&A section afterwards. Your, your questions, you can put in the chat box, and uh, in, in, there's a question, question uh, box there for your uh, to, to put in your, your requests and that type of stuff. I cannot see those questions during the webinar, so I can only ask them uh, uh, at the end. Uh, your, our customers uh, will also receive a follow-up email uh, with more information about the webinar and uh, you know a potential to get the recording and the presentation slides. And uh, now the next step is, of course, uh, we will start it. My name is actually Jos van Loo. I worked in protection for over 30 years. The agenda of the webinar is uh, quite straightforward. We have a, a short introduction. We advertise this webinar using Bodo Power System. So there will be two slides about our company for those people that don't know us yet. Then we're going to talk about packages, transient thermal impedance and, uh, and thermal resistance uh, and those issues related to protection. We're going to talk about the longer pulses here, the, uh, the TVS diodes, product positioning, especially a section about automotive pulses, applications also. Then we're gonna follow about a, with a section about ESD, uh, where we're gonna discuss a little bit more in detail, capacitance, dynamic resistance, uh, data sheet analysis, and interface. And in the end, we're gonna talk about the front end for both uh, products, DVS and ESD, and also the supply chain, which is uh, you know becoming more, became more and more important the last two years. Let's talk two slides about our company. TSC, Taiwan Semiconductor. We've got the TSC abbreviation, uh, not our famous uh, TSMC brothers uh, or neighbors, uh, the famous foundry. Uh, that's because we were already there for 40 years, so we're uh, not a young company. Uh, we have a revenues last year of 227 million dollars you can read more of the uh, on company information here on this slides while you do so i should tell you that we are actually are more than 20 years now already present in europe and uh, near munich we have a large customer service and quality department uh, center uh, also of course we have a, a, a sales force covering the whole of europe our company makes a rectifiers or that's what we're famous for uh, and TVS diodes, uh, these products uh, for rectifiers and TVS, I would say we cover about 95% of the whole product portfolio on the market. Uh, but we also have a few other uh, products where we are growing. Uh, the most important one for us is the MOSFETs, where we have a partnership with UMC, the second biggest foundry in the world. Uh, to and you know our design house is making MOSFETs that are you know will in the future be manufactured in their fabs. And we also have design teams for lighting ICs and linear voltage regulators. A lot of our products are AACQ qualified. This is an important automotive, is an important market for us, where we actually manage to be qualified uh, at a lot of tier one uh, automotive customers. Let's talk about packages now and transient thermal impedance and thermal resistance. This may sound like a very strange choice here because it's, uh, you know, if you look at what's important with a, uh, a protection is first and for all the clamping voltage. We don't want the uh, product to be destroyed. The robustness and power, uh, if it actually absorbs all the power, the TVS, you don't want the TVS to be destroyed. Capacitance is important and obviously uh, capacitance uh, will interfere with the signal or not. And of course, we do not live in a technical vacuum, so cost in the supply chain is also important to understand here. Now, look if you look at the three uh, technical requirements here, uh, clamping, uh, robustness and capacitance, those are more determined by the front end. So the back end is actually uh, also important in this area and needs to be understood. Uh, first and for all, if you look at the product positioning, uh, obviously clamping voltage robustness, capacitance, it's going to be completely different if you're going to answer those questions, uh, whether you're uh, protecting against ESD or if you're protecting against uh, lightning strikes or any inductive disturbance, or if you have automotive pulses you need to protect against. Of course, for the short ESD pulse, Right, you see that, that you know here in this case, obviously the clamping voltage is going to be uh, important and the capacitance uh, uh, is going to be important. The energy is so low; this thing is only 100 nanoseconds long that the robustness and the power are less uh, important criteria. 
of course uh, when you're talking about a lightning pulse uh, and uh, those uh, you know uh, you know um, uh, requirements on the TVS there then of course you see that robustness in power because there can be a significant uh, uh, you know power dissipation involved that those things are also more important here and maybe capacitance is less important here uh, so this is how you need to do the product positioning for the two different signals and uh, or the two different waveforms depending how much energy the pulse has Let's go to packages because that's where we're going to talk about and transient thermal impedance and also the thermal resistance here. Uh, you know, on the left, you will see that we have SMB, SMA and SMC packages. SMB was the first uh, package uh, in the market for TVS about 35 years ago. So these packages are around for a long time. And if you look at them, these drawings, uh, there are three things that you actually will see, immediately see. Uh, first and for all is that, of course, the ratio of the die, and the die is like here or on, on the here, this thing here, you know, so with the dimple here. So the ratio of the die to the, uh, you know, all, overall PCB layout actually is not that good. So uh, the package is a little bit wasteful, maybe. Then the second thing, of course, is if you look at the distance to get the heat out and every millimeter adds to your thermal resistance, then obviously, you know, uh, from that perspective, the design is also not perfect. And since day one, people complained about the height of the component, about 2.5 millimeters. All those flat packages, and some of them are not used in, in TVS, but uh, a lot of them are uh, here, uh, of course, uh, solve these problems. You have the short distance here. You have the ratio is better uh, of the die. And of course, the height is like now only 1 to 1.1 millimeter. So these new packages do give you advantages, uh, uh, you know, uh, or solve some of the uh, other uh, products uh, or package problems in the past. However, what we'll see is that the old packages will remain very important with TVS. And we'll explain that also a little bit later on why that is. Package choice, how can we help you? Well, first and for all, uh, here we are talking about TVS products and a lot of them like lightning strikes and uh, ESD protection are actually less than one millisecond. So usually as a rule of thumb, we can say that the transient thermal impedance or anything under 1.5 millisecond, depending a little bit on the die size, is all dissipated in the die. When the pulses get longer than the overall construction, the package, the thermal resistance, and that type of stuff also become important here. So if you look at it for a TVS and what we're trying to protect against, your first reaction would be, hey, we can take all those die, all those TVS die, like in an SMA and SMP, and just put them in a smaller package. And off we go. Yes, we can do that. We can get the 400 watts and that type of stuff out of smaller packages. So that is not a, a, a problem here. So that is a good uh, way to visualize where uh, TVS market trends could go. But there is a small problem. Not every TVS actually is used in, uh, in uh, protection uh, devices. A lot of them are used in freewheeling or as snubbers. And then you got steady state power uh, dissipation here. And now look at the thermal resistance here. I made an, uh, you know, uh, I took, gave here 20% of the thermal resistance, the overall thermal resistance to the package and about 80% to the PCB. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people here on, on the call, so automotive people may say, hey, I've got a more complex PCB, so for me, the package is more important and I've got multi-layers and that type of stuff. But there may be other people here that say, my design is very cost conscious, I've got a very uh, cheap FR4, and in my case, the package is only 10% of the overall thermal resistance. So in that case, of course, you can actually even say, does the package really matter? Uh, for you know, it's just the solder parts, really. So those are things that you need to uh, understand the, the difference between thermal resistance and transient thermal impedance when you look at package choice and how the roadmaps work or choice comes for a TVS product. I'm going to demonstrate this with a, a SMA 6F derating pulses. The SMA 6F is a series that we put in a package called the TIN SMA. You can see the, the package drawing here. Of course, it is 600 watt here. It's a 600 watt device here. Uh, you can see that here. So this is a standard 600 watt device here. In our data sheet, we have pulse one and pulse two. Those are steady state power derating curves. This is a tradition long-term uh, from the uh, 
TVS market, but not everybody follows it. Some people have changed uh, to a transient thermal impedance curves, but we follow the tradition of the thermal resistance curve. So you have a certain power, there's a thermal resistance here, and then that leads to a zero power dissipation at 175 degrees C. So our curves are uh, thermal resistance based, but we can make additional curves which are available upon the request. This is an additional curve for a 10 1000 pulse uh, here on the right hand side here. And what you see the 600 watts is derated differently and it goes not to zero at 175 degrees C. This is based because we are talking about one pulse, a single 10 1000 pulse in this case. And uh, as you can see, if you look at it this way, you have a lot of residual uh, capability here at 175 degrees C. And that is actually important because some automotive people might work in this region here to have that extra residual uh, capability here to give them an extra safety margin here. We give those pulses up on the request because we uh, would feel uh, uh, unhappy uh, if uh, people would uh, des design just based upon this curve. Because obviously uh, if here the 175 degrees C uh, maximum temperature is exceeded which is okay for a single pulse but it's not okay if you're doing a steady state power dissipation so that's why we're a little bit more conservative on these curves and these other curves are available uh, up on the request for single pulses but it's important for designers actually to understand that uh, difference here and uh, and uh, uh, understand that the uh, TVS can work in two ways power dissipation steady state the majority of that single pulses which have another curve. So more about steady state or transient thermal impedance. This is the DO218 package is one of the strangest packages uh, uh, in, in the business here. That copper block in the bottom here is, is bigger than uh, or thicker than two millimeter uh, things like that. So why is this package so uh, designed this way? This is all about transient thermal impedance and especially load dump pulses. A load dump goes from 40 milliseconds to 400 milliseconds. And as a result, uh, the, the power is no longer all dissipated in the die. Uh, you know, obviously the, the package, the rest of the package have to help here. And this copper block here is uh, more or less found out by action. It's just perfect to help dissipate these uh, products in the area to 40 to 400 milliseconds. So what you have here is that normally TVS pulses are characterized for 10 by one millisecond uh, pulses here and then derated to shorter pulses here. What we see here is that the, uh, the derating goes up to 5,200 uh, watts here for a 10 millisecond pulse. So you are working here more in the 10 to 100 millisecond uh, area here, which is perfect for load dumps because that's the area where they are working in. And that actually is uh, determined by the, the somewhat unusual uh, package design here that this helps uh, in, in that 40 to 400 millisecond uh, uh, area. So that's another area where, for example, understanding transient thermal impedance is important. These the devices, even though they're 6,600 watts, if you go to shorter pulses, they're not any better than, than a standard, let's say, SMC or so. If you go to 820 pulses, they're not better or so. This is just specifically there for the longer pulses. Another slide is the difference between a Zener and a TVS. I'm using here a, a, a picture of a Quadro Melf. Uh, I'm sorry, this uh, that uh, you know this is. I hope uh, people understand that the Quadro Melf is is uh, more or less slowly going to obsolescence here. So, but it's the 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 easiest one actually to demonstrate what I wanted to say. Because if you look at that picture of that Melf here, you see the two slugs. That's our, the, the silvery shiny things here. Then you have the black thing here, and between that is the uh, the dye. And what happens is the glass around it actually is uh, you know then turned into a vacuum, and then actually uh, you know produces what we call a pressure contact. I'm not saying that all Zener diodes are manufactured that way, but you know uh, uh, this is the key thing to understand is the quality of this contact is is very important, and that is linked to transient thermal impedance. So a TVS not only has a much bigger die than a Zener di uh, diode, but it is also assembled in a more robust way. It is soldered. 
uh, and that's all it means it can hardly handle short pulses here so this is actually the, uh, the 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 key thing here if you look to our uh, other friendly uh, packages uh, that are used uh, for zenos like salt 23s and that type of stuff you have to watch out a little bit because they can be uh, constructed in different ways and sometimes if the adhesives uh, the way that the dyes attach to the uh, to the lead frame is not very uh, thermally conductive, then also these things are, have a very poor uh, performance under search testing and that type of stuff. So, so this is something you need to understand. One of the major differences between a Zener and TVS is not just a bigger die, it's also you need to look at the package uh, you know, construction. And a TVS usually has actually a 10-1000 pulse on it, uh, in mass production without outgoing uh, quality control uh, and and as a result uh, you know that weeds out any poor contact there may be in the construction at all so that's something we need to uh, here explain a little bit of the, on the package design between a zener and a tvs Now let's talk about TVS uh, products and a little bit more about product positioning, uh, automotive pulses and uh, applications a little bit more. Uh, so we're first going to show you our uh, product portfolio here. And uh, no surprises here, there's been minimal changes here. The actual devices are still around, some people use that. TVS is sometimes used in uh, where the only as the only component in the mechanical construction, for example. So these devices are still around. Some people think that they have a better thermal resistance in snubbers. Uh, you know, if you, you're making a power supply, that may be uh, something uh, people still use a lot. But, you know, the packages, the, the most important packages are SMA, SMB, and SMC. And of course, this is the DO218 package here. So what are we seeing here as evolution in this range is that we're seeing the SOD123W package here. And this is the first time we'll talk a little bit more about the front end and the way the chips are manufactured here. But this is, you know, the, the, the first time that uh, planar dials can give you uh, advantages over GPP uh, in these smaller packages because you can squeeze a little bit more power out of those uh, out of those packages here. So the SOD123W uh, is uh, more or less uh, uh, 3.5 millimeter rather than the five millimeter of the SMA will also be able to handle the uh, 400 watt in the future. And then of course we have those newer packages with the short leads, SOD128 and thin SMA. We have one package here on the far right hand side here, that's uh, I'm pointing it out now, SMPC 4.6. Some people know that better as the TO277 package here, uh, which is a new uh, package for TVS, which may some have some, some good potential uh, in the future because it is significantly smaller than the SMC package here uh, for a similar performance. Yeah, there's a lot of synergy between rectifiers and TVS. That's why we are, uh, we are uh, usually most suppliers have both here, not just on the uh, back end, but also on the front end in the processes here. And uh, this is where we see the market going here. As I told uh, you before, the SMA, SMB, and SMC uh, are the long-term workhorses, but they still receive investment. So uh, these packages are absolutely not finished here and will be uh, slightly or very difficult to replace here. We'll explain that a little bit more in detail later on. But of course, the uh, SOD123W is a package uh, uh, up and coming, and also a package called the Micro SMA, which is more a rectifier package here. If you look here, there are two things, uh, the new packages uh, that we ha have introduced in the last couple of years, the Micro SMA here, the SOD123HE on the right-hand side top, and here the SMPC or TO277 uh, around here, they have exposed paths. Uh, one of the problems with exposed paths is that the difference between the anode and the cathode uh, is uh, has to be 1.5 millimeter for cleavage and clearance. That is not always given here, so uh, the, their um, applications in high voltage are limited. Not a problem for TVS, but a problem for rectifiers. Uh, so that is one of the limitation, limiting factors here for those new packages to, to uh, grow uh, very rapidly. The uh, thing, so that, those are the, uh, the other pack packages up and coming, uh, but that's why we think the older packages are still gonna be around for a while here. It's not always easy also, uh, as we showed it in the past, to make things smaller if there's a lot of power dissipation on the cheap PCBs here. The new packages here, SOD128 and TIN SMA, have 
during the whole uh, shortest period of 2021, 2022, had capacity available. So uh, those new packages uh, are still quite new in the introduction phase here. One thing, last thing I would like to point out here is that we have one kilowatt, 1 1.5 kilowatt SMPC in this package, in this package here versus SMC here. The footprint is around only 60% of the size here. So this is a nice cost reduction, or sorry, size reduction here, uh, potential for uh, your designs if that is an issue for you. So here we are, the SMPC package here uh, is uh, some one more slide here. It's even for automotive, it has a wetable flank here uh, to, to make sure that you can do your automated uh, solder inspection. And it is a 1500 watt device here. It's got an interesting transient thermal impedance curve. That is partially because of course the exposed pads, uh, uh, pads here uh, have a lot of copper in there. So that makes them slightly better in these uh, these uh, 40 10 10 to 40 millisecond uh, pulses in the uh, pulse duration uh, graphs so this is the uh, availability of this package which we think is a good package long term in broad applications not just automotive that brings us to automotive right so here we are this is more like a marketing slide uh, thing than that right so uh, the pulses uh, the pulses linked to to all kinds of in inductive uh, switches or inductive loads turn on and off and that type of stuff in car uh, you know it, it, you know of course uh, tend to have low energy with the exception of 2a they they are fairly easy to meet so all the standard and we don't even have all our components on this one here can actually meet them so it becomes kind of like interesting when we talk about the automotive uh, load dump tests here test a or test b without actually uh, without any um with centralized or without centralized the load dump here and so we're going to talk a little bit more about to better understand these these tests and see what we can do here so we feel personally that it's best to actually simulate these things so this is our uh, uh, workstation or, or test uh, setup here in 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 china uh, where we test all devices here our friends of course always like to 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 show that we have a uh, uh, a good performance here, you know, so the performance is not only um, determined by um, the uh, the die size in this case, but also very much by, and of course, this nice copper block, but of course, also by the quality of the, uh, of how the solder or the, the dies attached to this block here, of course, uh, also has a huge influence. So there, so there could be performance differences when the uh, the package uh, looks, uh, or the, the data sheet looks uh, pretty similar here. And also the clamping voltage could be different a little bit on the energy dissipation so this is so there there might be some minute differences here what our colleagues try to say here but you know the best thing to do here is also to construct to help us uh, ask us for help the, in your testing but we can give you at least some uh, hints here we have made an application note an 1003 and uh, you can see the link here the link here is at the bottom here uh, where you can download that application on our website of course what it does is you have the 40 milliseconds 220 milliseconds and 400 milliseconds the three curves here uh, of course uh, for each curve uh, the uh, the longer the curve of course the uh, uh, the more the, the energy in there so the the higher the internal resistance has to be for uh, the uh, product to, to pass the 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 load dump test so uh, if you say let's say on the far right here 101 so you need uh, 1.5 ohm uh, where should you as for 220 milliseconds you need just about 1.2 and you just only need one ohm for uh, 40 millisecond pulse so uh, these at least give you some guidance in designing these with these products and of course uh, this is just one graph the graph is also available in uh, for 24 volts and also with other die sizes here so this actually gives you an idea or at least a first help to uh, select these products quickier or more difficult to sometimes uh, uh, measure or not measure or things that to estimate is the centralized load dump here uh, where in this case it's 35 volts so sometimes you rarely see differences but uh, you you can but most of them are 35 volts of course here uh, there can also be uh, differences between uh, construction methods between suppliers that you can all see in the data sheet uh, but uh, what i would like to say here is that this is uh, trickier to do 
because if you remember the first graph, we also say that the SMC package can do it. And actually, uh, if you look at the next test, this is again, 35 volt, the test, what it does here actually is, you know, you take the 35 volt pulse, you uh, change the internal resistance from until you see failures, right? That's so you go from 1.5 to 0 0.5 volts here, and you have the highest uh, voltage here, the US uh, 101 volts. That is to accelerate uh, the testing as much as possible here. So let's go a little bit to the next slide here, and I'm actually going to go to the bottom here, this it says here P6 SMB. So actually this is a 600 watt device here. So what you see here is the centralized load dump comes here at 35 volts here. So the amount of energy that is gonna dis be dissipated in the uh, parallel TVS uh, actually also depends a lot here on the breakdown voltage. So, and on the distributions of the TVS. So if you take a 24 volt, 27 volt or 30 volt, actually the, the, the time the, uh, the TVS conducts actually is gonna be lower. And of course the current flowing through it, uh, depending on the RI, RI, the internal resistance you put in front of it are gonna be very much different because the clamping voltage is gonna be close to the to the uh, to the 35 volts. So that's something you need to uh, also look at for potential uh, cost saving is that if you go up in voltage, uh, if you can, and the clamping voltage of this device, this 30 uh, CA is still good enough, uh, then of course you can save some money on your 5B uh, pulses here. So that's another hint we would like to give you uh, on the design front. TBS distributions and increasing power. Actually, what happens here is that uh, this all the application nodes, I think, uh, disappeared here, but this, uh, that's because we have now three and five kilowatt SMC TBS uh, devices here. Uh, but uh, you can increase the uh, power, uh, power dissipation by putting two in series or parallel. Uh, and this is a known trick for, for years and years in here. And given the fact that the, uh, the uh, applications or our notes are off the, uh, of the web, I just made it a simple slide here. Uh, and to, so you get a feeling of what, you, uh, what happens here. Of course, if you put them in parallel here, so if you put them in parallel here, then they're all gonna have the same clamping voltages. So there will be uh, you know, uh, the same clamping voltages. So for, you know, uh, so of course, uh, some of them are gonna have a different uh, resistance and that type of stuff and a breakdown voltage. So the currents through each device is gonna vary a little bit here. If you put them in series like this, you put them in series like this, what happens is they're all gonna have the same current, the same current here. So what happens is that the clamping voltage is gonna be uh, um, uh, not the same here. So there's gonna be a spread in the clamping voltages. So in the case, of course, you can say, hey, one and one here, if you put two in parallel series, it's not two here. Yes, you need to derate here. But what I'm showing here is that these clamping voltages and, and breakdown voltages are distributions are actually pretty tight here. So you don't have to uh, um, essentially derate that much. So these, these uh, distributions uh, for these uh, um, products here are, and this is a, a, a five percenter, but they're all five percent essentially, is actually very tight. So this is uh, good for you to know and uh, good for you to understand. The last thing I'm going to show out on this slide actually is here, I'm going to show the clamping voltage, which actually the spec test spec in the, the data sheet spec minus the, uh, the guard band here is actually far away from the performance. That means here that this actually product has a very big die for the uh, actually versus the, spe the, the, the data sheet specification here. That's something that you know is say, okay, good to know. Uh, or you can say, hey, I want the cheaper part anyway. Uh, I don't need these extra uh, parts here. I would just like to show you the next slide here because that actually is something a lot of European designers don't uh, are not aware of. This is something you can get easily from Wikipedia and it shows the amount of lightning strikes per square kilometer per year here. And if you're in Europe here and if you're designing in Europe, you'll see that actually we're not the center of the world when it comes to lightning strikes. As a matter of fact, we have very few lightning strikes. And as a result, you can say, hey, uh, you know, um, uh, we have few, fewer uh, lightning failures. However, if you're a European company and all of a sudden you export, your products export to uh, Florida or Singapore, which are the two famous hotspots uh, where you have field failures. Uh, then of course, all of a sudden these, uh, the lightning strikes are, are becoming more important. You have many more, their, their intensity might be higher. And also don't never forget, so um, 
the lightning strike, they may be anarchists, right? They might not follow, always follow the norms. So that's another thing you need to be uh, uh, be aware of. So it's in places like Florida or Singapore, and if you have exposed equipment or equipment that is exposed to the elements, that's where you're going to see the different die sizes uh, between the various suppliers, and that's where you're going to see that if a supplier has a bigger die size, he will have you will have fewer field returns. Uh, so that's something you need to be aware of uh, in uh, you know in for for the general uh, understanding of of uh, product failures or field returns here. Um, the die size can be still be important, and the norms can be exceeded by the lightning strikes. We now go to ESD, and uh, we're going to talk about capacitance, dynamic resistance, uh, data sheet analysis, and interfaces here. Uh, quickly about capacitance here. Uh, or no, first and for all, uh, our ESD uh, selection guide here. Uh, actually, here we have a, sh a smaller product portfolio. These are only our recommended parts. We have a few that are older parts also on there, and you can see that we have a number of parts with one, two, or four channels per. Uh, per uh, per package here, you can see, of course, the product range is largely split in two parts. You know, the low capacitance 0 0.4, 0 0.121 picofarad type of products, and of course, the uh, the nine picofarad uh, more zener type uh, products here. And this, of course, it goes for the fast data lines, whereas the nine picofarad may be more for um, you know, like the bus lines or something like that here. Of course, they have a different uh, working voltage and they come in a different package here, which we're going to show you uh, in a second here. So with these uh, with these uh, product portfolio, we think we can uh, address the majority of applications in, in the business here. Uh, or the most important interfaces here. We're relatively new to this. We've been, we've done a few ASD protection devices, but recently we acquired uh, a number of specialists here to expand our market share and focus on this area more. Of course, the package portfolio is here. It is usually split uh, between the newer leadless packages and the older SOD or SOT type of packages here, as with most components. LDIDT uh, is the voltage. The DIDT, uh, you saw the rise time of these ESD pulses is 10 and minus 9 here, or you know, the the uh, nanoseconds, right? Uh, one amp or five amp in nanoseconds. So any nano Henry of uh, inductance is unwelcome and produces voltage here. So those leadless packages are slightly better uh, optimized for ESD packages, but some people uh, get acceptable performance out of the uh, old SOD323 and SOL23 style uh, leaded uh, packages. So these are, of course, the key packages which we are offering here uh, for further integration. And I will show you, the, the, the one is a single line. These are popular packages here, uh, but these are when, of course, you have uh, uh, two lines or three leads here are uh, is slightly novel or not a real novelty, but it's, it's newer on the market. The past Capacitance here, this is just a simple Wikipedia drawing here of capacitance in a in air, I think it's between two plates or something like that here. Uh, uh, we're transferring that now to a semiconductor, in this case, a uh, diode here with an anode and a cathode. Uh, and in this case, uh, the A in the formula, capacitance is, is the permittivity or material constants multiplied by A divided by D. The A is the die size and the D is the depletion layer for our uh, devices here. Die size, so it's very simple. Uh, you reduce the die, and actually, you actually can also then reduce the capacitance here. So that's the number one trick. Uh, and the second one is this depletion layer here. This depletion layer is very dependent on the voltage here. And we're going to show that here on this graph. This is a TBS graph, not a ESD graph. But what you're showing here, we're having a series, uh, one kilowatt in SMB, from 10 volts to 100 volts. So what we're showing here, as the depletion layer uh, or as the voltage goes up, this depletion layer actually gets bigger, and it's actually in this part, so the capacitance gets smaller. So for you go from 100 to uh, 10 to 100 volts, the depletion layer goes up and up and up. So the capacitance goes down with the device, with the device with between 10 or 100 volts. Here, this part of the curve, it's always the TVS is always biased at its working voltage, you know, at uh, either 10 volts or 100 volts. 
when you go here to the y-axis, you take one device here, the 100 volt device, and if it actually is biased at its uh, at 100 volts here, then you can see it's around 80 picofarad. So this is a big die, right? So this is a, a you know die of, of uh, uh, something like a millimeter and a half or, or or more here. So it's huge here. And then you reduce here the uh, capacitance uh, uh, over the 100 volt product here, and of course you see that the uh, capacitor goes up as the depletion layer gets smaller and smaller. So that's more or less how capacitors work. But of course, uh, you know, we are in the semiconductor business. So people are using tricks to make these capacitors uh, smaller. And also you'll see that some of these capacitors are now nonlinear. That actually just shows you how complex some of these um, uh, high-end uh, ESD protection devices are and how you should, you know, not underestimate the complexity and the CMOS technology behind them sometimes. Capacitance in the circuit here. Uh, so the data line this is an old USB 2 type of uh, type of application here. So you have the, the bus line, which has different capacitance requirements over the uh, data lines. Uh, the capacity you put two capacitors in series that's the formula for it well known so what happens is the smallest capacitance dominates so you just put a small capacitance in in in, in series with a tvs and then you bring the capacitance down that's the essential trick so the plus one goes from here and the bottom uh drawing from the plus one goes from through this diode the top right diode through the tvs and then the bottom left diode to the ground here for example and of course you can go the other way around here for the negative pulses. Uh, so th those are uh, the, 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 the tricks you use here. So here you use uh, two in series with the, uh, with the unidirectional uh, TVS. So that's what we use to get capacitance down. Of course, you can also use integrate. These are really, really small die, right? With the die here that, that take care of ESD are very small. So you can integrate the multiples of two or four, even in smaller packages, absolutely not a problem. Different interfaces like USB, HMDI have a different maximum capacitance, so you have different insertion losses in this case, this, uh, this case. so different requirements here uh, on the capacitance. And some of these are non-linear capacitance, so we're talking about complex CMOS products, not uh, simple products here. Uh, that's something else we need to say uh, carefully or point out here. I'm going to take one random part here. This one here, we're going to talk a little bit more about the data sheet of this part and, and uh, explain it a little bit more here. So this is comes in the package is a DFN of one by a 0 0.6 millimeter here with three leads here. And so two pins here or two data lines here to ground. Uh, what happens is you should always look at this bit here, ESD protection, 20 volt, kilovolt air and 20 kilovolt contact. You know, this is a pretty, uh, um, sturdy device of course it, it sometimes goes up to 30 kilovolts here but obviously as we saw uh before um and the higher you put the requirements here you the more energy you might need uh, it might have an influence on your tie size also or, or the amount of, of, of the, the construction of the product here so you always need to compare apples to apples here and you also need to look at uh, what esd ratings is actually aimed for here there, of course, the uh, we're going to look at the transmission line pulses a little bit later here, but of course, there's a clamping voltage using the transmission line pulses, and there's a clamping voltage using an 8 to 20 microsecond lighting pulse here, uh, which actually has nothing to do with ESD, but it's the way we actually test them in mass production here. And you have the uh, ESD capacitance uh, uh, spec here uh, available, 0 0.65 picofarad, so that's pretty good. Dynamic resistance here. You know, this is used. We use something called the transmission line pulse to um, to uh, measure the dynamic resistance here. Uh, and what happens is, of course, it plots the voltage in relationship to the current here. The uh, lower the dynamic resistance, uh, the lower the clamping voltage. So that's what people usually think in the ESD world uh, that uh, the the dynamic resistance gives you a lower clamping voltage that may be so and that is good here but what happens actually in the ESD world is that you are putting this product in parallel to an interface ic most of the time which may have 
on board the ESD protection itself and some ESD diodes on it. What happens is that if you have the lower uh, dynamic resistance, it means that the ESD protection part, or uh, in this case, the TSC one, will actually do more of the work and uh, less of the work is done in the IC here. So this is one of the reasons why this dynamic resistance is actually an important parameter here and it needs to be specified here and looked at a, a in, 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 in detail here because it's not like in a TVS where if all the energy is dissipated in the TVS there might be something in parallel and that's why you want to have this dynamic resistance characterized in detail and as you can see the, the, the folks in our lab you know measured a few competitors and in this case we did well let's keep, compare two protection diodes uh, technologies here the package is always the same it's this package here the 2510B10 uh, here which is got the 10 contacts here and is essentially for four lines here. Uh, here we have a 5 volt part and the capacitance is 0 0.8 picofarad. Here we have a 3.3 volt part here and the capacitance is 0 0.8 to 28 picofarad here. The main difference here is you're going to look at these transmission line pulse curves here. The transmission line pulse curves of this part looks like a traditional uh, TVS per pulse or a Zener pulse. This one here, actually, this device has a thyristor uh, uh, behavior in that type of stuff. Thyristors are not new in uh, protection business. Uh, they used to be on the old landlines uh, in telecom here. TechCore, I think, invented it uh, in the past. And of course, there are people like ST and Shindingen also used it uh, in, the, in the old days on line cards here. But they're becoming now popular in also in ESD protection. You know, the advantages are still the same. You, the breakdown voltage is much lower. So for the same type of uh, pulse or uh, current, here let's say 10 amp you're going to dissipate much lower power so uh so you can actually shrink the die size a little bit here so and of course also the clamping voltage is lower so those two things are are pretty good uh good characteristics to have so these are things uh that uh, give the advantages also to this type of technology in ESD protection the only thing that that needs to be known is that thyristors have a, a holding current or holding voltage and uh, you know that's not a problem on a, a data line where you have constant zero and ones uh, where it automatically resets, but it may be an issue if if, uh, if if you're using it on a constant five volt line or something like that, then that's not the appropriate technology to use. So two more or, or an additional technology uh, to the array of, uh, you know, or an additional tool we have to make even better products is that are these um, fallback devices. There are also minor fallback devices here, which have a slightly different uh, uh, technology explanation. Data sheet analysis, they look similar to TVS the data sheets here, which are their long term and that type of stuff. Each data sheet will have, I'm going to show briefly here on the four circle parts, uh, is what our difference here. Of course, each data sheet you should really study. It's also in the absolute maximum ratings. The ESD pulse that you can handle here uh, to compare apples to apples here. The interfaces are usually mentioned uh, where it can be used here. And the other thing I would like to, to mention here is the clamping voltage. And this is done on this 8 to 20 microsecond pulse, which has nothing to do with actually what we're protecting against, but it's the only thing that is available or practical in mass production here. So uh, you need a, this is mass production test equipment, and we test it to 8 to 20 microsecond pulses here. And of course, uh, please, uh, from now on also, not just look at the capacitance, which is usually what the first thing people do uh, when they look at these data sheets, also look at the uh, dynamic resistance here. Uh, to see uh, what the performance is of the device. More data sheet analysis here. I'm not going to go to all the data sheets uh, curves here, but just a few things here. Um, actually, here this is the transient thermal impedance here curve here uh, with the uh, with some capability still at 125 degrees C. This is not so practical for uh, ESD protection and not so used that much. But the non-repetitive uh, peak pulse power versus uh, time here. If you look at these ESD pulses, and here you have a hundred, a thousand microsecond or one millisecond. So if you look at a 10, 1000 pulse, actually this thing cannot even do 10 watts. So it just gives you an idea how small the die is. 
and you know, how little the performance is. They are really optimized for ESD uh, performance here. The clamping voltage is given uh, both against an 820 pulse and as a TLP uh, uh, transmission line pulse here. This one, you know, representing more uh, what happens in an ESD circuit here. And then, of course, you have the uh, capacitance. Uh, here, which in this case, if you look carefully, is a non-linear, right? So uh, the old uh, simple Zener technology is gone, and we're looking at a complex CMOS IC, and that's you can actually de detect that from this uh, from this uh, from this uh, graph. Then you know a couple of commercial slides or simple commercial slides here. The amount of interfaces we know is is or we have. A number of famous uh, interfaces, HDMI, USB uh, 2 or 3, and that type of stuff, which is available are uh, on, on most products or in a lot of products here. And we have uh, these are our proposed solutions uh, for all of them uh, for all these products. So, for the most popular interfaces, we have a solution. What we are seeing here is that those solutions can usually be broken up in three parts here. You've got the uh, new high-speed uh, um, uh, in USB 3, the high-speed data uh, uh, here that needs a very low capacitance here. You have the old products here, which take care of the uh, USB 2 part of the interface here, and they have the bus line where uh, you, you, capacitance is, is not an issue, so you can even go for another cheaper solution here. The same for HDMI. Uh, where actually here, uh, you know, the solution uh, goes from, uh, you know, the very fast video signals uh, to the, uh, the less fast uh, products here, and you can split the interfaces in uh, in several products that are optimized for each uh, potential applic, uh, you know, optimized for capacitance and cost and, and construction. So. To finish up, two more slides, uh, and here uh, we don't have those things in our uh, data sheets uh, as, a, as things that we're, we're collecting them and that type of stuff. But for each of these products, and this one is for the uh, four lead, very fast, the 0 0.28 pico fired one, the thyristor based product that we showed before. If you actually do that on the HDMI test, and I've got the correct HDMI somewhere else, it's not on this slide here, but uh, on which it was test, uh, tested, but we have all that is available in a document here. The, we pass the eye test here and that type of stuff. We're gradually building here. Uh, we don't make interface ICs, so we have to go to external labs to, to uh, uh, build these graphs, but we're, graphs, we're gradually building them for our product portfolio, uh, and uh, we can also support you uh, with this information in case you didn't find it in our data sheet and you were looking for it. So, eye diagrams are available uh, from our company. Then, the last thing is the uh, supply chain and the front end uh, processes uh, here. Uh, that's how we like to finish up. Uh, things that we've all seen the last two years with a few uh, products, uh, with a few delivery. Uh, uh, issues here and longer lead times here. How does the supply chain of these products work? Of course, TVS is a not an easy supply chain. We have uh, the, the Taiwan Semiconductor has more than 3,500 part names. Obviously, that doesn't mean that we have 3,500 die uh, because some of these dyes are used in in, in various uh, packages and that type of stuff. But we still have a lot of die, so you can imagine that it's not from a front end. This is not a uh, uh, an easy process here. GPP stands for glass passivated product uh, uh, pellet. That's this thing here. That's the technology we use. That's the cheapest and most cost-efficient technology available on the market. It comes on smaller wafer sizes. A lot of people say, ah. Uh, you know, smaller wafer sizes, bigger wafer sizes, sometimes it's bigger. Well, not always, not if you have 3,500 part names, it is, uh, it is not. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, we think this technology is uh, four or five inch for GPP. It's just perfect here. Uh, planar processes, uh, that is the processes uh, that are, you know, you use, you, you, you usually see at school, uh, you know, the typical uh, process steps uh, or the typical uh, die layout you see at school here, they can reduce die sizes for uh, GPP, especially because the voltages are low here. Uh, they are not cheaper in that type of stuff, but as a, as a result of planar process, you can use some smaller packages in the future. So that's something where the front end might change a little bit here. But larger eight inch fabs are not 
particularly desirable due to these many uh, part names here. TVS, in an 8-inch fab, the TVS has the same problem as a, for example, a trench shotkey diode. It usually is the wafer with the lowest uh, revenue or the, the, the technology with the lowest revenue per wafer. As a result, in, in days of allocation, it usually does not, not get enough attention in larger wafer fabs. So this is something you need to understand about the supply chain. And obviously, with 3,500 voltage part names, it, you need to, to have a good partner uh, to take care in, on the customer service side here. ESD is a different, uh, completely different story, right? A few parts uh, can, uh, can cover most application here. Uh, some suppliers have 200 plus part names. Uh, we also have uh, more than what we've shown here. Uh, and that is because of package proliferation here. There's a lot of older packages uh, uh, around the market here. But we, we think that uh, there is no need for such a large product uh, por uh, portfolio. Uh, to address this market here. We might add a few more packages like SOD 523, some bi-directional ones for audio and that type of stuff. We're still continuing to building our product portfolio, uh, but we are uh, gradually uh, building the, the most popular uh, interfaces and expanding it. So what you do need to know is, of course, a Zeno diode in, in the good days when there are no bottlenecks, uh, you know, you can probably uh, manufacture them in the front end for in two weeks or something like that. These uh, uh, ESD products, some of them are complex CMOS processes with, uh, you know, uh, they are multi-layer IC design. So as a result, it's not that, uh, you know, they uh, can be uh, made uh, overnight in a wafer fab. You need to also plan for that, even though the die sizes can be small. And as a result, uh, because the die sizes are small, uh, as a result, uh, you get a lot of die per wafer in these things. But it's not a problem in this case because you can do it with very few part names. So this is something we wanted to give you away uh, with you on the supply chain and on the front end processes. That ends, we're just about 50 minutes, so we're on time here. That ends the uh, presentation here. Uh, I am now going ready for questions and I'm going to look at the question box. Here, my question box. I see one question here, but I can't read it. Uh, <clears throat> Can you, there is a, a question asked by somebody and I can I can only see version, depending on version or something else. Undina, can you help me and, and read the question please? Or somebody else? Hmm. What is your turn? There's one question about the, I'm sorry, the, I should see if I can actually uh, make the box uh, uh, a little bit bigger because I think there are two questions, but I cannot make my, my uh, I, oh, Sorry, I, I have problems too to open it, but we can answer the questions after the webinar via email. Yeah, sorry. I'm not sure why. Uh, something why is not working right now. Yeah, I don't know why we can uh, we can't make the, yeah. the question box. Apologies. Uh, Apologies. <laughs> sorry, the the question box is uh, very too small. I'm just spearing with my eyes on it. So we, actually, the uh, questions are uh, recorded uh, automatically when we record a webinar. So we will get back to you uh, with the, with the answers uh, to that. So I see a question about the DF and uh, 1006 and that type of stuff, but it actually is 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 impossible to. Uh, I can read it only line by one. So I, I do apologize for the, the two, I think there are two or three people that ask questions. Uh, so I do apologize uh, for not being able to, to answer them online, but you will get a, a response to your questions tomorrow. And I'm sorry uh, for that. Uh, given that, then I would say uh, thank you very much for uh, attending the webinar. And uh, as a result, uh, you know, you will get a follow up email uh, about the information. Uh, which we shared with you. Uh, once again, thank you for your attention and I wish everybody a pleasant afternoon or depending on your time zone, a pleasant morning also. Thank you very much and goodbye.